to the real use cases and the evaluation. Let's first introduce some preliminaries. A graph is defined by the vertex set and the edge set. Typical graphs include social network, citation network, and the knowledge graph. We summarize the graph algorithm into three categories. Traditional graph algorithms analyze graph structure. Graph embedding algorithms represent a graph in a low dimensional space. Graph neural networks build real networks for graph data. To train graph algorithms of graph data, there are single load systems such as graph chi and a grid graph, and distributed systems such as pregale, graph lab, and graph s. Tencent has one of the largest social network graphs in the world, since we have applications such as QQ and WeChat. In this large scale graph, there are more than 1 billion users and hundreds of billions of edges. Applying graph processing needs to consider the current big data platform in Tencent. The current big data platform is built with Hadoop ecosystem, such as HDFS, Yarn, and Spark. And many tasks are pipelined by Dataflow system Spark. So to do graph processing in the existing big data platform, the first solution is to combine the data flow system and the specialized graph processing system. However, integrating different ecosystems is difficult and costs a brittle and a complex interface. Besides, it incurs extensive data movement and the duplication across network and file system. Considering that the big data platform in Tencent is built with the Hadoop ecosystem, our previous solution is to use a Hadoop compatible system, GraphS. GraphS can be easily integrated into the existing pipelines because its underlying engine is Spark. Although GraphS has been used in Tencent for years, it has several problems. GraphS abstract graph data as tables and use table join operation to implement graph algorithms. It also leads to perform shuffle operation during mapper and the reducer. When training binary scale graphs, this architecture costs explosive memory footprint and a slow disk I.O. Besides, GraphS does not support graph embedding and graph neural network algorithms. With the problem of GraphS, we ask a question, can we do better? The first goal is to stay inside the Spark ecosystem because we do not want to change the existing pipelines which have been running for years. The second goal is to efficiently process large-scale graph data. The third goal is to support different kinds of graph algorithms. To this end, we design a new graph processing system with a private server architecture. This is the framework of our system, PS Graph. The parent server stores high dimensional data and the model over several machines. Parent server can solve the system bottleneck brought by high dimensional data. The master load manages the running job. And the com computation engine is Spark Executor with PyTorch embed. On parent server, we can store data in different data structures such as sparse and dense vector, sparse and dense matrix, CSR vertex, and neighbor table. The data is partitioned over several machines, either by row or by column. Parent server is also responsible for the synchronization between workers across iterations. In addition to data storage, Parent server can also do some data manipulation. We provide many data operators, for example, pull, push, add, multiply, division. Users can also implement user-defined functions 
using a PS Fun interface. Parent server can do checkpoint to HDFS uh, for failure recovery. The master is responsible for resource allocation, task monitoring, and the failure recovery of a parent server. We use Spark Executor as the computation engine on each executor. We implement a parent server agent that transmits data between executor and the parent server. The graph data is stored as Spark RDD, either edge partitioned or vertex partitioned. Traditional graph and graph embedding algorithms are executed in the JVM runtime of Spark. To support graph neural network algorithms, we embed PyTorch inside Spark and run in C runtime. If an executor fails, we restart the failed executor and reload data. Meanwhile, the other executors are blocked. We let's show the use cases of PS graph and the evaluation. Page rank measures the importance of vertices, also called rank. The update rule uses incremental vertex ranks to save communication when the model barely changes. The size of vertex rank can be very large and is frequently assessed. Therefore, we store vertex ranks and the increment of ranks on parent server. The original dataset is edge partitioned and stored on HDFS. Each executor reads data from HDFS and use group by operator to transform edge partition graph to vertex partition. At Y iteration, each executor gets data ranks from parent server and calculates the updates of data ranks. Then the parent server adds data ranks to ranks and they reset it to zero. Afterwards, each executor pushes the local updates of data ranks to parent server. Common neighbor measures the closeness of two vertices and is used for link prediction. This algorithm leads frequent access to the labels of a vertex. We therefore store the label tables on parent server. The executor uses by to transform the original graph to label tables and push the label tables to parent server. Then each executor reads one batch of edges at each iteration, gets the label tables of relevant vertices from parent server, and calculates the common labels of each edge. Line is, is a graph embedding algorithm that uses both first order proximity and the second order proximity to measure the similarity of two vertices. Each vertex has two latent vector, an embedding vector and a context vector when the vertex is a context of other vertices. These vectors can be extremely huge for large scale graph. We store them on parent server. They're stored as a user defined vector. The size is the number of vertices and the data type is a user defined type containing an embedding vector and the context vector. During one training iteration, the executor gets a batch of edges, pulls the necessary embedding vectors and the context vectors from PAM server, use stochastic gradient descent to update these vectors and pushes the update to PAM server. Graph Sage is a graph neural network algorithm that learns the representation for vertices. Instead of training individual embeddings for each vertex, graph sage learns a function that generates embeddings by aggregating features from the labels. There are three frequently assessed models, the vertex features S, the label table A, and the weight matrix W. We store them on parent server. X and A are partitioned by the index of vertices. 
and W is partitioned by a column. The training steps are as follows. The user writes PyTorch script and generates PyTorch model. Spark driver loads PyTorch model and pushes the initialized model to parent server. Every executor loads PyTorch model, reads the dataset, generate label tables, and then it pushes vertex features and the label tables to parent server. At each iteration, the executor reads a batch of edges, samples k hop labeling vertices. Then it pulls the vertex features and the current weighted weight matrix from parent server. Perform back propagation using PyTorch and pushes the gradients to parent server. After training, the system outputs the vertex embeddings. And there are more algorithms in our system, such as fast and folding, k call, and the triangle count. In the evaluation, we use three datasets. DS2 is a very large dataset with 2 billion vertices and 140 billion edges. DS1 and DS3 is smaller than DS2. The experiments are run on a productive cluster in Tencent. We compare PS graph with Graph S and Ola. Ola is a graph deep learning framework developed by Alibaba. When training DS1 dataset, we use 100 executors for Graph S and allocate 55 gigabytes for each executor. We use 100 executor and 20 parameter servers for PS graph. PS graph is eight times faster than Graph S on page rank, three times faster on common labor, and three times faster on fast and forty. Besides, PS graph consumes much smaller memory than Graph S. Graph S encounters out of memory error on K call and the triangle count, even giving 55 gigabytes for each executor. On DS2 dataset, Graph S cannot run due to auto memory error, while PS Graph can run page rank in seven hours and a common neighbor in three and a half hours. We let's compare PS Graph and Ola on Graph Sage and DS3. The pre-processing of PS Graph is much faster than Ola with the help of the efficient Spark pipeline PS graph consumes seven seconds every epic, almost 30 times faster than Ola. Besides, PS graph needs much less resource than Ola. To assess the ability of failure recovery, we conduct an experiment on common labor and the DS1. We manually kill an executor and the parent server. The queue server we we'll restart and reload the checkpoint label tables from HDFS. And the killed executor will restart and reload the checkpoint of graph edges. PS graph can recover very quick, uh, quickly, five minutes for executor failure and six minutes for prime server failure. Thank you. Well, thank you, the speaker, for uh, the presentation. Um, so uh, we have a couple of minutes for questions. I'm going to look at the Slack channel or the Zoom chat in case you want to uh, type your question. I, I can read it uh, back to the author. Uh, one quick question I had for um, the author while we're waiting. Uh, so those data sets that you use on your evaluation uh, uh, I might have missed that. Was that synthetic data or did you get the data sets from uh, some production use cases at uh, Tencent? Hey, hello everyone. Uh, so this data set are the real data set in Tencent. Yeah. And uh, if I may ask, uh, like what kind of uh, application was that? Or if you're not allowed to say it's fine. <laughs> uh, so basically the data sets are the social network uh, graphs in Tencent, and we use them to analyze the connections 
and uh, do link prediction between users. So basically, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so, There's one question um, uh, from Arun Swami. I'll read the question. Uh, does PS graph work with other than PyTorch, PyTorch computations? Uh, sorry, by, by other than PyTorch computation, you mean the TensorFlow and other frameworks, right? I would assume so, yeah. Or, uh, or currently, we, we only support PyTorch, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. OK, thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, um, we're gonna move to the next paper uh, now. Thank you again for uh, the speaker for answering the questions. So the next uh, paper, uh, it's titled Just JD Urban Spatiotemporal Data Engine. And the speaker is Ryan Lee, who's a PhD student at the School of Computer Science and Technology in Sydney University. And uh, his research focuses on spatiotemporal data management, distributed computing and urban computing. So let's please start the presentation. Hello, everyone. This is Rui Yuan Li from Xidian University and Jindong ICT. In this presentation, I will introduce our JUST project, Jindong Urban Spatial Temple Data Engine. As we all know, we are living in an age of big data, and most of this data have spatial temporal properties, indicating when and where an event happens. This spatial temporal data is very useful for many urban applications. For example, path planning with trajectories economic analysis with online order data, and the epidemic prevention with pandemic data. However, it's challenging to manage spatial temporal data for its huge size and the complex structure. There are two categories of ex existing systems for spatial temporal data. The first one is based on relational databases, such as Oracle Spatial, PostgIS, and MySQL Spatial. But they usually fail when the data gets large. Thus, they face the scalability problem. The second one is based on distributed frameworks, such as Hadoop, Spark, HBase, and so on. However, these systems are not designed for spatial temporal data. They may have efficiency problem for spatial temporal data management. Besides, these systems are hard to use. Users need to delve themselves into the handbooks and uh, implements their own spatial temporal quality predicates and the operations. In our work, we propose a distributed spatial temporal data management system, DUST. It adopts a space as the underlying storage, Spark as the execution engine, and the GeoMesa as the indexing tool. This is the system framework of just a platform. Where the new proposed modules are highlighted, are highlighted by the orange boxes. Just has three notable characteristics, scalability, efficiency, and ease of use. In one word, just can manage massive spatial temporal data conveniently and efficiently. For scalability, 
because just stores the data in disks with its base and the load necessary data in memory with Spark. To this end, it requires little for the clusters. We tested it just using a cluster of five nodes with an increasing of data size. The indexing time and the storage size is really close, but the query processing time does not increase much. That is to say, just to manage massive spatial temporal data with limited resources. As discussed before, we use the HBase as the underlying storage. However, HBase provides only one dimension key, so it does not natively support spatial temporal data. GeoMesa is an indexing tool to transform multiple dimensional information into one. For example, it first encodes the latitude, the longitude, and the time into a binary code separately. Then combines these three binary codes into one. As the time is unbounded, it breaks the time into multiple disjoint time periods, such as one day. However, it's not easy to determine a proper time period. If the time period is not chosen rightly, the different scales between spatial and temporal dimensions will cause the spatial filtering useless. Here is an example. If the user submits this data request, GeoMesa may generate a disk key range. This contains many irrelevant records. To address this issue, we propose new indexing strategies. Instead of combining spatial and temporal information together, we use an individual spatial index in each time period. In our experiments, we find that the speed up of, of our new indexes with regard to the default indexes of GeoMesa is up to two. Just the platform also proposed a new storage schema for the spatial temporal data. For example, to manage trajectories, existing key value data store, store and GPS point in one row. This leads to an endurable large number of data records. Storing each GPS point separately makes it hard to compress data. So we propose to store an entire trajectory in one row with compression. This not only reduces the storage size tremendously, but also improves the query efficiency by reducing disk I.O. You can get more information about the new storage schema in our another accepted paper in ICDE this year. Users can create view tables in just to catch the data in memory. This avoids disk excesses and further improves the query efficiency. In our experimental settings, just shows its compatible query performance and it is more scalable than the state of the art. You can see in the right picture that some other systems fail when the data size gets larger, but just can handle it easily. To make just easy to use, we introduce plenty of data models. 
the schema and the best adopted indexes are, pre are predefined. Users don't need to know the underlying knowledge of Just. All they should do is to tell Just what types of table they, they want to create. For each data model, we preset many out of the box, box functions, such as noise filtering, map matching, reachability discovery, HP scan, and so on. We also build a new user interface. All of above operations can be done with a circle-like statement in our portal. Moreover, we also provide Python or Java SDKs for the upper applications and a notebook for machine learning. Because of easy to use, many urban applications have been built easily based on Just. Here, we introduce two applications briefly. We are facing with COVID-19 now. There are more than two million confirmed cases, causing about 130,000 deaths. This number is still rising. That is why we meet with each other online instead of in Dallas. To fight the disease, the first step is to find the infected clause. We know that the, tra the trajectories of people can reflect human activities. As a result, based on just, we built a system to effic efficiently detect the suspected infected clouds. Our system is deployed in many government departments in China. All trajectories are granted by the users. We found hundreds of suspected infected patients within the first 20 days. Another case is map recovery. The fine grand load networks in the living areas are missing. In Jindong, we have more than 60,000 queries. We can leverage the, the trajectories of queries to recover the fine grained load networks and infer the traffic model and the traffic time of each load segment. The most challenging task is to how to efficiently manage and process the tra big trajectory data. This is a system framework of map recovery. We use Dust to efficiently manage the massive trajectories, including noise filtering, segmentation, map matching, and query processing. With the help of Dust, we can build this system in a much easier way. Our work has been accepted by Chico AI of this year. In one world, he proposed a distributed spatial temporal data engine, Just. All we do is to manage massive spatial temporal data conveniently and efficiently. You can find more information about our project in the Just homepage or contact me through the email address. I'm Ray Yuan Li. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you, Yuan Li, for uh, the presentation. And um, so we have one question on the chat for you. Uh, the question is from Karin Zaituni, and it's, um, can you please clarify the difference between Z2 and XZ2 indices, and if they need uh, any parameters, how to choose them. Okay. Oh, um, thank you for the question. Um, Z2 and uh, XZ2 are the indexes of the 
uh, GeoMesa. Um, they to, um, both of the two indexes, uh, and the main idea of these two indexes is to find, uh, uh, find a region to present the, uh, the records. Uh, but uh, C2 is for the point data, but uh, XC2 is for the non point data, uh, such as uh, polygon or, or uh, light string. Um, if you uh, want to um, uh, know the, uh, the underlying knowledge of these two indexes, you can find the, uh, the re reference the paper in our, in our the, uh, in the paper of our uh, just uh, reference. Um, okay. okay. Thank you for the answer. Um, I have one question. Uh, I was wondering if your system has any support for uh, streaming queries. For example, if we want to install an alert, if we want to check if a courier uh, stays within a route, uh, within a certain area and within time, can we install like a streaming query and then uh, get alerted if uh, that uh, object uh, diverges from uh, the path? Uh, I'm sorry, I, I can't, uh, uh, but uh, because my uh, my spoken English not, is not very well, uh, you, uh, so if you have any question, you can send me, uh, can hand me through the email. Uh, so that's fine. Uh, thank you. Uh, okay, I can follow up offline. I can follow up offline. Um, okay. Uh, so let's thank uh, the speaker, and uh, we're gonna move on to the next um, presentation. So the next presentation um, is titled uh, "Oracle Database in Memory on Active Data Guard: Real-Time Analytics on a Standby Database." And the speaker is uh, Sukada Pense, uh, who manages the transactions teams at Oracle. And she was one of the lead developers on the database in memory option for Oracle database. So let's please start the presentation. Hello, everyone. My name is Sukada, and I'll be talking about some of the challenges we encountered while extending Oracle's database in-memory advantage to another Oracle infrastructure known as Active Data Guard. This work is a collective effort by the Oracle database in-memory and the recovery teams. We'll start off by understanding how database in-memory works, how Active Data Guard is architected, and why having in-memory on Oracle Active Data Guard is a valuable proposition. Next, we'll look at some of the scalability and performance problems and our solutions to them. And finally, what the performance evaluations say about the design. Database in memory is one of Oracle's fastest growing options. It introduced the industry first dual format database, which maintains two different formats of the underlying data, a row store format for OLTP and an in-memory columnar format for faster analytics. Now this doesn't necessarily double the memory footprint because the columnar format can be specified at granular levels, like for a table, for its partition, subpartition, or even a subset of columns that you would otherwise build your analytic indexes on. As a result, you get the best of both worlds, a system that is well-suited for OLTAP workloads. If we look under the covers, database in-memory works through units called in-memory columnar unit, or IMCUs. Each IMCU represents a chunk of row store data, or in database terms, it is responsible for the data contained in a range of database blocks. IMCU is therefore built by querying the row store data as of an SCN, or a system change number, which is Oracle's notion of database time. IMCU can therefore be looked at as a static snapshot of the row store taken at the specific SCN. This is typically done as a background activity so that it does not block transaction processing. However, since IMCUs are read-only snapshots, the data loaded in the IMCU becomes stale as transactions modify the underlying row store. Hence, the validity of the loaded data 
is tracked by the snapshot metadata unit or the SNU. Whenever a row, column, or a block is modified in the row store, its corresponding representation in the IMCU is deemed invalid. Invalid data is not read from the IMCU, but is in fact read from the row store. So if we look at the picture here, we see that queries have to consult both the IMCU and the SMU in order to serve consistent results to applications. Now let's change gears a bit and talk about Active Data Guard Standby Database. As the name suggests, the primary goal of the Standby Database is to serve as a disaster recovery solution. The Standby Database is therefore a copy of the primary database and it is maintained via application of redo logs that are shipped from the primary. It therefore lags the primary database by sub-second delays based on network delays. What's interesting, however, is that this is not just a backup copy. It is a queryable copy that's separate from the primary. So analytic workloads, giant reporting queries can all be run on the standby database by leaving the primary database free for transaction processing. Workloads like big data analytics, which are not very sensitive to these sub-second delays, can be easily offloaded to the standby database. And that hints at the value that database in memory can bring to ADG. All these analytic workloads, reporting queries, can run orders of magnitude faster once we bring database in memory on ADG. Similarly, customers can partition their in-memory tables across the primary and the standby databases. For instance, the current month's sales data can be in memory on the primary database, whereas the entire last year's sales data can be in memory on the standby database to run reporting queries. This allows customers to achieve workload isolation and yet reap the benefits of in-memory faster performance. So we went back and studied the Active Data Guard architecture. And long story short, Active Data Guard is maintained via a process called as redo apply. Redo logs received from the primary database are sorted by the SCN or database time. An array of processes known as the recovery worker slaves are responsible for applying these logs to underlying data blocks. The mapping of these recovery slaves to data blocks is deterministic and is obtained by just hashing the blocks. Each process can thus independently keep applying logs. For each database block, all the changes are applied in the increasing order of SCN. But of course, across processes and across database blocks, there are no real guarantees. Until the coordinated thread publishes what is known as a queryable SCN or query SCN on the standby database. The coordinator essentially tracks the minimum applied SCN across all the recovery slaves and periodically publishes the SCN up to which all the row store data on ADG is consistent and queryable. Although this seems like a daunting task, the rate of query SCN advancement is pretty fast on ADG and that's the one that allows ADG to keep up with the primary database for disaster recovery. So our challenges, of course, our benefits were clear and so were our challenges. While providing the in-memory advantage to ADG, we wanted to make sure that we are able to target different objects to be in the columnar format on primary and ADG. The column store data should be maintained consistently on ADG along with the redo apply because there are no real DMLs on the ADG system. We wanted to make sure we don't regress the capability of ADG to provide disaster recovery, which means any layers that we add for in-memory on ADG have to be extremely thin and provide very, very low overheads. And finally, since Oracle Database in-memory and Active Data Guard both scale seamlessly across Rack and Oracle multi-tenant, we wanted to make sure we are compliant with those models. So the remaining set of slides will cover how we leveraged some characteristics of ADG to resolve some of the challenges. At a high level, we decided to piggyback on the redo apply as well as the query SCN advancement processes. These are the components you see as the mining component and the invalidation components. And these are primarily responsible for 
maintaining the consistency of the in-memory columnar units on ADG. Of course, we had to tweak the population infrastructure a bit to allow for the quirky behavior of the queryable SCN on ADG. And finally, we built certain low overhead data structures like the commit table for making sure that we did not regress the disaster recoverability of ADG. So first, let's take a look at how population infrastructure works on ADG. Each IMCU has an associated load SCN or the time at which the IMCU was created. This is the time at which the row store is queried and transposed into the in-memory columnar format. Of course, because we are on ADG, we have to ensure that the load SCN is equal to the query SCN because that's the SCN at which queries are known to be consistent. So in the short interval, while the coordinator is in the process of advancing the query SCN, we prevent the background population activity from choosing this load SCN. Similarly, whenever background population activity is picking up the load SCN, they ensure that they pick up the most recent queryable SCN. Once consistent IMCUs have been built, the next big task is to make them consistent with the redo application activity. And for that, like we mentioned, we piggyback on the recovery slaves. As redo log gets applied to the underlying row store, the mining component captures essential metadata about the changes required to the IMCUs. This metadata can contain information like which rows were modified, which columns were changed, as well as certain control information like which transaction changed the row and what SCN the transactions changes were committed. These metadata are together known as invalidation records. And these mined invalidation records are well, journaled. Now this begs the question, why journal? Why not flush the invalidation records directly to the SMUs? One important reason is shown in this slide. The invalidation record may be mined when the background activity hasn't had a chance to create the SMU yet. So even though the invalidation record was mined, the SMU hadn't been created and we couldn't flush the invalidation record to anything. Now, if the SMU were to get created the millisecond after this invalidation record was thrown away, the queryable SCN could advance and we would have what is known as a missing invalidation, which means a wrong result served to queries. So it's a definitely good idea and extremely necessary to journal these invalidation records. Now, what are the characteristics of this journal? The key goals for the journal design are, firstly, to not let recovery slaves block each other because ADG infrastructure makes sure that database blocks are distributed to recovery slaves in a deterministic manner. So for row store redo application, recovery slaves work off independently. The second, since a transaction's changes are either completely visible or not visible at all to queries, we wanted to make sure that all invalidation records of a transaction can be accessed together. And that's when we came up with this design for the in-memory journal. The journal is essentially a hash table, the size of which is decided based on the number of recovery slaves. This avoids things like false contention. The journal hashes on transaction identifier to create an anchor node for each transaction's invalidation records. Within the anchor, each recovery slave is provided its own private area to write the invalidation records that it mines for a particular transaction. Now, once we have journaled all these changes, we need to find an optimal time to flush these changes or to flush these invalidation records to the SMU. And that, as you may have guessed, is when the query SCN advances. To do that, we essentially piggyback on the query SCN advancement coordinator. The coordinator knows the target query SCN. So we make sure that any transaction that committed at an SCN below the target query SCN 
must flush its invalidation records to the SME. Now, of course, you could go through the entire journal, find those invalidation records and flush them, but that's suboptimal. So we built some quick access structures like this commit table. The commit table organizes transactions by their commit SCN, and it also provides a direct link to the anchor pointer in the journal, which maintains invalidation records for the particular transaction. So whenever the query SCN is adv advancing, the coordinator simply has to walk through this list, chop it off at a certain point, and beyond that point, all transactions have invalidation records that need to be flushed to the SMU. Now you may observe that all of these transactions can be processed in parallel, and that's exactly what we do. We take the help of recovery slaves to flush these invalidation records to SMUs. This cooperative behavior of the recovery slaves and the query SCN advancement coordinator sort of balances out the producer consumer problem here. The producers are the recovery slaves and they produce invalidation records. And the consumer is the query SCN coordinator, which is flushing these invalidation records to the SMUs. So given all that, where did we land up? So here is a comparison of how a certain workload runs with and without in memory on active data card. With database in memory enabled, the data card is able to sustain 4,000 operations per second, 1% of which are analytic queries requiring full table scan. To make sure that we are not just reading static data, we also threw in 70% updates, which is 2,800 operations per second. And we observed a speed up of between 80 to 120x. Similar speed up is observed also for inserts and updates and insert, update, delete mixed workloads. The final number I have here is for making sure that the rate of redo application is not regressed by these extra layers of database in memory we added on ADG. So we got a large column store, approximately 120 gigs. We had two Oracle instances on the primary doing a lot of transactions. We had two instances on active data guard standby database, and we threw in a bunch of small, medium, and large transactions in an Oracle multi-tenant setup. Observing the progress of the redo logs on the primary and the standby over a two hour period, we would confirm that redo apply is still able to catch up. The query in advancement is not severely affected by database in-memory activities on ADG. So the key takeaways, along with active data guard enabled with database in-memory, standby database still remains committed to disaster recovery. Customers are able to isolate their in-memory workloads. Analytic and reporting workloads offloaded to the standby run orders of magnitude faster and the plethora of features developed for database in memory are all now available on the standby database as well. Thanks, and we open the floor for questions. Thank you, Sukada, uh, for the presentation. Um, so please type your questions on the chat. Um, one thing I, uh, just a quick reminder, uh, is that we are um this is the uh industry session of high performance scalable data platforms and this is room two in case you joined recently uh we have two more papers to go uh one thing i was gonna mention is that uh i got texted by one of the participants who didn't have um uh, uh, good quality on the slides uh, what might help is that if you don't see the video screen on your Zoom uh, client, you may want to quit the meeting and rejoin and see if that fixes it. Um, one uh, question that I had for uh, Sukada was, uh, in practice, how far behind does the standby um, database run? For example, if I want to have uh, some queries, analytical queries, uh, do, you, do you offer any guarantees? Like, is it gonna be within a few seconds or that the data will appear there? Hey, thank you all for listening and thanks Stavros for the question. Yes, that behavior is tunable for 
Active Data Guard, and we have different modes called Affirm, Sync Affirm, and even some modes which ensure that all commits are in fact durable on the standby before they get returned to the user. So yes, that is tunable. And in practice, I would assume that based on the use case, because only analytics are typically offloaded to the standby, most of the time I would assume that customers do not necessarily care about the delays on standby. But yes, since the query has seen advances probably 10 or few more tens of times every second, I assume that the standby is very, very close to the primary. So just to be clear, like uh, just to get the sense of the range, we are talking about seconds or even uh, sub-seconds. So for example, if a report yes. needs to have one minute fresh data, they can comfortably run it on the uh, standby database. Oh, yes, definitely, yes. And there's uh, one question from Hamid uh, on the chat. Uh, can the slave be versioned, keeping the whole history while primary only keeps the latest version? And so uh, it's much smaller, good for transaction processing in memory. Uh, yes, if I understand the question right, this might be about the in-memory columnar units, which yes, in effectively are versioned, and we do have some sort of a multi-version concurrency control on them as well. Okay. Um, hope that answer Hamid's question. Uh, if not, please. <laughs> You can follow up on the chat and maybe we have Sukade as well uh, follow up on the chat. So uh, Sukade, in case you haven't seen it, you can click on the chat uh, button on your Zoom client and you can see the question there as well. So feel free to follow um, on the chat as well. Um, so we're gonna thank uh, Sukade once more time and uh, we're gonna move to the uh, fourth uh, paper of this session. So the next paper uh, comes from LinkedIn. Uh, it's titled Data Sentinel, a declarative production scale data validation platform. And uh, for this presentation, uh, all three authors uh, are gonna uh, be part of the video that you're gonna see. Uh, so uh, the first author, Sriram uh, Vasudevan, is a senior software engineer in LinkedIn's AI team and has worked on a variety of problems ranging from large-scale data validation to machine learning fairness and job search. Uh, the second author, Arun Swami, uh, is a principal staff engineer at LinkedIn and uh, he was the one who founded the Data Sentinel project and has been leading the Data Sentinel service to enable data validation. And lastly, the third author, Jiwei Huin, uh, is a software engineer in LinkedIn's AI team and is currently working on improving the machine learning behind LinkedIn uh, learning and before has worked on problems of large scale data validation and feature monitoring. So let's start with uh, the LinkedIn uh, paper. Hello and welcome to today's presentation on Data Sentinel, a declarative production scale validation platform. The authors of this paper are Arun Swami, Juje Huen, and me, Sridam Vasudevan. I'll start this talk by motivating the need for data validation systems and provide a high level idea of what Data Sentinel is and how it works. Following that, I will show a demo of Data Sentinel through the service we built around it, Data Sentinel Service. Finally, Juje will go into the more technical design details of Data Sentinel and Data Sentinel Service. The consequences of poor data quality are best summarized by the statistic from Eckerson et al. American companies have lost a whopping $600 billion in revenue due to bad data. Closer to home, LinkedIn's job platform was affected by poor data, with metrics declining over a certain period. It took several engineering hours to identify and fix the underlying issue, which of course was poor data quality. This incident is indicative of two common themes regarding bad data. It can be an insidious problem and retrospective data debugging is hard. We thus need data quality solutions that operate at a regular cadence in production settings. These systems need to be easy to use and understand and must also factor in big data aspects. To address these challenges at LinkedIn, we built Data Sentinel. So what is Data Sentinel? It is a platform that enables data validation in an automated manner as opposed to reactive manual data debugging. It achieves this by evaluating assertions or data checks on column definitions or fields of interest. System generates a report that can be consumed programmatically by downstream workflows. 
and is also visible on the web UI provided by Data Sentinel service. As its inputs, Data Sentinel takes the data that needs to be checked, as well as a user-provided validation configuration file. This file contains two specifications, the fields of interest, which we call column definitions, and the data checks that need to be performed on them, called assertions in Data Sentinel parlance. The platform produces two outputs. The first is a statistical summary of the entire dataset and the specified column definitions, known as the dataset profile. The second output is the validation report, which captures evaluation outcomes of the provided data assertions. Here we have a system diagram of Data Sentinel. It is a Spark application at its core, thereby taking into account big data and production environment considerations. It is driven by a validation config, making it easy to use and understand. The data set of interest is validated, and the system produces a data set profile and a validation report, as I mentioned earlier. The validation report can be consumed programmatically by workflows that operate on the data set that was validated. Optionally, Data Sentinel also takes as input the data set profile from a prior run. This allows it to perform overtime comparisons or validations against a golden data set. The system can also capture samples of records that have failed assertions, thereby enabling users to debug data quality issues. Let's take a closer look at the validation configuration. It is written in Hokon for human optimized config object notation, a superset of JSON. The declarative nature of the config makes it extremely easy to specify, understand, share, and verify. Furthermore, being schema backed, it provides robust compile time validation and serves as a documentation of the supported parameters. Now, the first section in this file deals with column definitions. The right pane here shows us an example. A column definition is a declarative specification of a field of interest. It can be a top level or nested path to a column as seen here in the column path field. It could also be a virtual or derived field that uses SQL expressions or UDFs. For example, we make a SQL here to derive a null safe string. Shown in brown at the bottom is an example of a constraint that users can specify as part of a column definition. Constraints are nothing but data assertions and are syntactic sugar that allows users to group assertions with the column definitions that they operate on. Next, let's take a look at an example of an assertion. A data assertion is a declarative specification of a check that needs to be performed on the entire data set on individual values of one or more column definitions, or in a metric or statistic computed on these column definitions. Data Sentinel natively supports more than 30 such assertions, and users can always add their own using SQL expressions and UDFs. Let's move on to Data Sentinel's outputs now. The dataset profile captures metadata and a statistical summary of the entire dataset, as well as the column definition specified in the validation config. The advantages of such a system are manifold. Firstly, it serves as a method of pre-computation and caching, thereby speeding up assertion evaluation. Second, given that this profile serves as a sort of signature or fingerprint of the dataset, it can be used for overtime comparisons, even when the older dataset is no longer available. Finally, it can be used to chart dataset trends and detect time series anomalies. Shown below are some of the 25 assertions that data sentiment supports. The second output is the validation report, which captures details about assertion outcomes. It contains a high-level summary that provides information about the number of assertions that have passed or failed. It also provides details on a per-assertion basis, thereby enabling easy data debugging in the case of assertion failures. This output is persisted to disk in the form of a structured report that can be programmatically consumed by downstream workflows. The results are also published to the web UI of Data Sentinel service, as shown in the figure. Now that we have a high level understanding of what Data Sentinel is, let's take a look at a demo of Data Sentinel through the Data Sentinel services web UI. This video provides an overview of Data Sentinel's many features by going over various components of Data Sentinel Services UI. Signing in takes us to a home page that displays data sets of interest as well as a high level summary of assertion outcomes. The Datasets tab provides us with an exhaustive list of all datasets onboarded onto the service, and one can also use the search feature to find specific datasets. Let's take a look at the Audience Insights event dataset. 
DSS provides the user with a quick overview of the validation status of the most recent run, as well as a historical timeline that can be used to understand if data quality issues have been fixed. Scrolling down, we can see details about individual assertions and their outcome. Let's take a closer look at one that's failed. Users can provide a description of what the assertion validates. Here, the user wishes to ensure that the main size of an array containing company IDs remains stable. Clicking the tooltip shows us the corresponding column definition in detail. The user leverages a SQL expression to retrieve the appropriate information from each record. The evaluation details indicate that this assertion has failed because there was a drop of about 31% in the mean value while the user was okay with at most a 30% change. The historical detail section shows us how this assertion has performed over time. We see that it has failed the last two runs. Clicking on the profile tab takes us to a page displaying various statistics for the most recent run. We see here the dataset volume in bytes, as well as the record count. The definition metrics tab contains statistics for column definitions. Let's take a look at the mean value for the actor current company ID's aggregate column definition. We see that its mean value for the most recent run was 0.54. Clicking the drop down arrow shows us a line graph displaying how this mean value has trended over time. We see that it has remained pretty stable and that it has dropped pretty recently from a value of 0.77 to a value of 0.54. The definition values tab captures distribution related details such as frequent values and quantiles. Users can also subscribe to assertion failures based on their severity. Clicking on the star icon adds the dataset to the home page as shown earlier thereby providing quick access and the high-level summary. Juje will now provide us with more insights into the design of Data Sentinel and Data Sentinel service. Thanks, Sri Ram, for explaining the validation configuration, dataset profile, and validation report. My name is Juje, and I will be highlighting some aspects of Data Sentinel's design. To easily define properties of high-quality data, we designed Data Sentinel so that users do not need to write and maintain data checking code. Instead, Data Sentinel performs data checks that users declaratively specify in a simple validation configuration file, as illustrated on this slide. So how does Data Sentinel perform these specified data checks? We designed Data Sentinel to dynamically generate SQL queries that perform these data checks as illustrated in this diagram. Starting on the left, Data Sentinel deserializes the configuration's content into a simple Java object. Based on this object's values, Data Sentinel dynamically generates and executes SQL queries to compute statistical summaries of column definitions and perform data checks of constraints and assertions. From these queries, Data Sentinel obtains the results and serializes them to the dataset profile and validation report files. To validate large scale datasets, we designed Data Sentinel to utilize several performance optimization techniques, as illustrated in this diagram. Data Sentinel treats Spark as a pseudo in memory distributed database by bulk loading the dataset of interest into an in memory, fault tolerant, and scalable data structure the Spark data frame. Persistence in main memory enables Data Sentinel to quickly access this data for many computations. Furthermore, Data Sentinel utilizes the concept of strategic caching. In other words, Data Sentinel performs complex and expensive computations only once and persists the results for later use. For example, Data Sentinel persists the results of the computationally expensive statistical summaries of column definitions to the dataset profile. As a result, Data Sentinel performs many data checks by merely looking up the appropriate statistical summaries in the profile instead of scanning the dataset again. 
Data Sentinel only scans the data set in main memory to perform complex data checks that require results not persisted in the profile. This scatter plot illustrates the performance of Data Sentinel's data validation jobs. The x axis measures data set size in gigabytes, an approximation for the data validation workload. The y axis measures gigabyte hours, which is a resource utilization metric measuring the total memory consumption of a, distri of a distributed computing application over time. This scatter plot illustrates a roughly linear relationship between workload and work rate, approximated with gigabyte hours. This linear relationship shows that Data Sentinel's design and performance optimizations make it scalable. The outliers towards the left side of the scatter plot occur because job submissions and execution times on the internal LinkedIn computing clusters can experience high variability. The outliers along the bottom of the scatter plot occur because some Data Sentinel data validation jobs immediately fail due to incorrect user specifications. To address data quality in production environments at LinkedIn, we provide a complementary system to Data Sentinel called Data Sentinel Service, abbreviated as DSS. DSS helps specify and recommend data checks and provides intuitive visualizations and drill downs of trends and results in data set profiles and validation reports. This diagram illustrates how DSS interfaces with Data Sentinel. DSS provides user interfaces to specify data checks and visualize trends and results of data set profiles and validation reports. The screenshots shown earlier by my fellow presenter Sriram are some of the user interfaces provided by DSS. Internally, a DSS server stores and manages current and past versions of validation configurations, profiles, and reports, which makes it easy to share and retrieve them. DSS also provides user interfaces to schedule and deploy data validation jobs. Furthermore, DSS leverages an internal LinkedIn platform and a container orchestration system to automatically optimize resource parameters and dynamically allocate resources, respectively, for data validation jobs. Due to time constraints, I will not be able to go over all design aspects of Data Sentinel and DSS in further detail. However, I invite you to read sections three through six of our paper, Data Sentinel, a, de a declarative production scale data validation platform for more details. Thank you for your time. Thank you, the speakers, for the presentation. Um, there are a couple of questions on the chat uh, in case don't have access to the chat. Arun, if you can just uh, repeat your answer. So the question was like, uh, how do you deal with the validation of semi-structured data like protobuf or JSON? Yeah, the, the answer is that currently we don't uh, handle uh, semi-structured data in complete um, details. However, we do have some partial support for single level nested features uh, like uh, arrays of uh, primitive values. Um, and eventually, we expect that there'll be some work done on this, but right now the system does not support it. Thank you. And there was another question. Uh, I'll re uh, repeat the answer here, like about what kind of errors and data quality issues you are targeting. And the answer was that uh, there is a list of assertions uh, on the paper, over 30 assertions, both within the data set and comparing the data set. Uh, one uh, question that uh, I had uh, for you was, uh, uh, are there any other applications you are looking uh, for data sending, for example, uh, not just uh, data uh, validation, but maybe performance regressions or things like that where you need to track history of how different versions of a software, software has uh, performed in the past? Absolutely. In fact, one of the interesting things, it started out with just being purely about data quality as, you know, has the data set uh, regressed like a mean and all that. But over time, what we have found is people are using it for many kinds of interesting applications because they're effectively checking the output of systems. Uh, for example, model output and other things and seeing whether those are regressing in some way or the other. So, so effectively, depending on the semantics of the data being checked, that in turn effectively checks the system, underlying system. Thank you. 
Interesting. And just another quick follow-up. And uh, do you let your users then specify a custom action to be taken? Like if, if something fails validation, do you only get to see that it failed? Or for example, if I wanted to take an action, send an email or do something custom or provide custom code to take an action, does this, is this supported on your system? So right now what we support in terms of actions is somewhat limited. We do send an alert email, right? In addition to the UI you saw, we also do send alert emails and the alert emails contain a link to the to the report so they can act on that. Secondly, uh, Shiram, I think, talked about this earlier in the system diagram that we do have support for programmatic intervention. So the idea is a workflow can be monitoring uh, the validation and they can actually, because the report, uh, validation report is programmatically consumable, you can actually inspect it to find out what has changed, what might have uh, done, and then take appropriate action. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Arun. Thank you, uh, speakers uh, from uh, LinkedIn. Uh, one quick reminder is that there are a few uh, couple of questions going on uh, on the chat if you want to follow some uh, of the follow-up questions uh, from previous papers. Uh, and now we're going to move to the last uh, paper of the session. Uh, so the next and that one is uh, comes from Facebook and it's Turbine, Facebook's service management platform for stream processing. Uh, the presenter is Jerry Chen, who's a software engineer at Facebook, and he led the stream processing effort at Facebook uh, up until recently. And recently, uh, Jerry is uh, spending his time building machine learning systems for large scale ranking models. So let's start uh, the Turbine presentation, please. Thanks for calling in. And today I'm going to talk about Turbine, a stream processing service management platform we built at Facebook. Most of you probably know what stream processing is. To help everyone understand today's talk a bit better, I will do a very quick intro. In the database world, we have data stored in storage and the user will submit lots of queries to the database to get results. On the other hand, in stream processing, we have an infinite amount of data, and we have a fixed query to process the data and the generated output in real time. For today's talk, there are a few important properties of stream processing that's worth mentioning. First, we need to process the data all the time. Second, we have a very tight latency budget, often on the order of tens of seconds. Third, the amount of data we got can vary quite a bit from time to time. We'll see how those requirements have a big impact on why we designed Turbine in the way we did. In today's talk, we'll use Scuba as an example. Scuba is a real-time analytics system at Facebook, and it is used for real-time ad hoc analysis of arbitrary data. For example, site reliability engineers watch server errors by using Scuba. When an error occurs, we can pinpoint whether it is due to a bug in a particular endpoint, a service in a particular data center, or some physical issue with part of a data center. As you can imagine, latency is quite important here. Let's take a quick look at how Scuba works. On the input side, we have Scribe. Scribe is a message by system widely used at Facebook. It's like Kafka. For a site reliability example we mentioned earlier, machine would log relevant information into Scribe. Then stream processing jobs will process those information and annotate them with dimension data, such as data center, rack ID, and then load those data into Scuba. Once the data is available in storage, user will be able to run object queries against them. In today's talk, we use the Scuba Tailor as a running example. The purpose of Scuba Tailor is to continuously ingest data into Scuba storage. As we mentioned earlier, the latency is quite important for Scuba. After data is logged into Scribe, it should show up in Scuba storage within tens of seconds. Each Tailor job ingests data for one particular Scuba table. A typical service level objective here is the P99 latency should be less than 90 seconds. Those jobs by themselves are pretty simple. They just deserialize the data, convert them into the proper format, and write them into scuba storage. 
but uh, they run at uh, a big scale. On the, on the diagram to the right, you can see the throughput and uh, the number of tasks for scuba tailor as a whole. Peak ingestion throughput for scuba is on the order of hundreds of gigabytes, and the number of tasks are on the, uh, on the order of 100k. Those requirements are common for all stream processing jobs. So those challenges are, one, very strict and service level objective. So typically, P99 latency on the order of tens of seconds. And uh, we need to satisfy those SLOs, assuming machine failures and large amount of traffic variations for the input data. The second challenge is we are running at large scale. So we have tens of thousands of machines hundreds of gigabytes of data per second, and several thousand distinct stream processing applications. And Scuba Taylor is just one such application. Now, let's take a look at the high-level diagram of Turbine. At high level, there are three big components here, job management, task management, and the resource management. Job management stores, those info stores the job information. When user authors a query, the resulting job information will be stored in the job store. Job management also handles complex job updates. We'll talk about any of the details here a little bit later. Uh, task management then gets a list of detailed task information from the job store and uh, schedules those tasks. It also performs load balancing. Due to the time limit, we won't be able to go into the details here. Please look at the details in the paper. The resource management layer is responsible for dynamically adjusting the resource allocation to the jobs. It also has a global view of the whole system so it can make cluster level decisions. In addition to the user, Turbine also takes on call as first class citizen. The on call can override decisions made by those automation systems. In today's talk, We'll mainly cover portions of the data management of the job management and the resource management. For the rest of the talk, we'll focus on one particular problem: how many tasks we should launch to process data for a particular scuba table. This problem is trivial when we only have a few jobs to, uh, to deal with, but for a service with hundreds of thousands of tasks, this can be very challenging. For example, who decides how many tasks we should have? How to update the number of tasks safely? How do we satisfy the 90 seconds SL when the load can vary a lot? We'll look into the details of those problems and we'll see how we solve them. So the first problem we want to take a detailed look at is who decides how many tasks we should have. There can be many decision making here, many decision makers here. First, we have a user. A user can provide some initial guesses. For example, here, user can say the number of tasks should be equal to the amount of petitions we have in the input scrap category. Then there's auto scaler. Scaler automatically decides the task count based on various factors. And uh, we'll look into the details about auto scaler a bit later. And finally, they are on calls. And in fact, there can be multiple on-calls, user on-call and service on-call. And all those I mean, actions can happen at the same time. How do we reason about this? Do we want to apply those changes in the order of the time those actions were performed? In that case, on-call might not have a chance against auto scaler. The scaler runs all the time. So should we stop the scaler if on-call wants to make some manual overrides? Obviously, that's not very desirable. To solve those problems, we develop a hierarchical job config system. Here, we have four levels of configs. First is a base config. It defines a collection of common settings like package name, version number, checkpoints, directory. So we, here, we typically don't set the number of tasks here. And this is usually set by the input developer. Then we have the provisional configuration. It is set when user creates or updates the application. Here we set, here we set the number of tasks to be the number of petitions we have in the input stream. The scalar config 
is updated by the autoscaler whenever it decides to adjust a job's resource allocation based on the workload and the current resource usage. Finally, the on-call config is used by on-call when human intervention is needed to solve an ongoing service problem. Those configs are exactly the same format and they are ordered by priorities. On-call config has highest priority. We can also set expiration time for the on-call overrides if needed. Each actor will update their corresponding config and the final job spec is generated on the fly. We'll take a look at how it will be used a little bit later. Now we know the number of tasks. How do we update the jobs to the right number of tasks? First, let's take a look at the steps we need to update the task count for a job. First, we need to stop the existing jobs. Then we need to wait for the stop to finish. And then we will redistribute the checkpoints to match the new task count. And then we'll start the new jobs with the new task count. Finally, we'll wait for the whole thing to finish. Now let's see what can go wrong. We already mentioned there are many actors for the system. If two on-calls are updating the job at the same time, we might corrupt the checkpoint. What if in the middle of the process, uh, failure happened? Can we make sure the system is left in a consistent state and is able to recover by itself? To solve those problems mentioned earlier, we'll have two tables in the jobs.db. First is the expected job table. It stores the high code config we mentioned earlier. This is where all actors write their modification to. The second table is a running job table. This table contains the running job config. It is a source of truth for a task management system. Then we introduce a state sinker to, uh, to reconcile the difference between the expected jobs and the running jobs. If the task count in the expected table doesn't really match the running task count, the state sinker will perform the fancy transition steps we mentioned earlier. When those transition steps are done, state sinker will commit the new job config into the running job table. And we also make sure the transition steps are unimportant and the final write to the job table is the commit point. Finally, let's take a look at how we provide 90 seconds SRO when the input data volume can vary a lot. In this chart, we show the input rate for one job. The peak time input is about 50% higher than the value time. And sometimes though there can be sudden spikes. Obviously, we cannot count on humans to react to those kind of load changes. To solve those problems, we'll need autoscaler. We mentioned the autoscaler a bit earlier. Now let's take a detailed look. Autoscaler has a few building blocks. First, it has a symptom detector. It will look at, at various metrics and decide if we need to make adjustments. For example, it can look at the lack of stream processing jobs. If we encountered an SO violation or about to have violation, the autoscaler can take action. One possible action is to increase the number of tasks for the job. Plan generator will take the input from the symptom detector and then figure out the new plan with help from the resource estimator and pattern analyzer. The resource estimator will estimate the usage of resource for a given job. This information is then combined with the historical traffic patterns to generate the actual plan. Now let's take a detailed look at the estimation for the task count. Here is a basic formula on how we estimate the number of tasks we need. It's basically the amount of data we expect to consume divided by the processing rate of each task. If currently we have lags, lag recovery time will also be taken into account. The interesting parameter here are the input rate and the estimated processing rate. For the input rate X, it's a combination of both the current input rate and historical pattern. For example, if we know the current input rate is 5 GB, and we know in one hour it will be 6 GB based on historical pattern, we will then just use 6 GB. Obviously, the amount of time we look ahead is configurable. For the estimated processing rate, typically for a particular job, it's predictable. 
So for a newly provisioned job, we'll measure the processing rate during the canary time. Once it's running in production, we'll continue to monitor the progress and adjust the value properly. For example, if we have a lagging job, then the, uh, then the uh, observed processing rate will be a good indicator for the peak processing rate. Now, we have, uh, now, and here's one example showing the stable in action for a particular scuba table. Here we have a job which was stopped for a few days due to user error. Once the user fixes the problem, uh, there's a large amount of lag to process. And uh, Scalar was able to quickly scale the job to 128 tasks, and it changed through all the lags like, very quickly. Here's another example showing how Scalar deals with data center level events. Here we have a storm starting in the morning of day two. And in day two, we got quite a bit more traffic. Scalar was able to increase the total amount of tasks to deal with the increased traffic. When the storm ends, the amount of tasks was adjusted back to the normal level. Okay, that's all I'm able to cover in today's presentation. And please check out our papers for a lot more details. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry, for uh, the presentation. Um, so uh, let's give it a minute for people to ask questions on the chat. Uh, one quick question I had uh, is, uh, what happens if you know that the pattern uh, is predictable of the traffic? For example, if you know you're going to have a peak uh, every day at noon uh, and so on, can you uh, disable or can you program the autoscaler to uh, provision the tasks uh, Proactively, so I mean, there's a forward-looking period, right? So I mean, with like, I mean, like when you know the pattern, so you can say, "Hey, I want to look forward for how long." So that's a configurable, I mean, a parameter. And uh, I think we actually uh, don't occupy all the results, so we actually, I mean, like, I mean, like look forward for um, a few hours only. So we do some dynamic allocation. That's I think that's what happening right now. Okay, thank you. Um, so I think with that, we're going to uh, end our session uh, right on time at uh, 11.30 local time. I would like to thank all the speakers for uh, participating and uh, especially the Zoom uh, hosts for helping us uh, deliver uh, the talks. Thank you all for tuning in. I hope uh, you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.